titled this uh, text Decisions uh, of Faith. You know, we've been in the faith chat, and I think every title I've had had faith in it. Of course, why not? It's the, it's the faith chat. But Decisions of Faith, life is made up of decisions every day. You know, some are simple, some are unimportant, some are tough, some are extremely important. Many are made almost unconsciously, whether we, whether we think about them carefully or not. Some decisions are made by default. When we put off deciding, but a decision is usually made for us. We decide it because we decided to put it off. The course and quality of our lives are determined much more by our decisions rather than our circumstances. Christian living involves making the right decisions. You can tell the maturity of a believer by the decisions that he or she makes. You either make a good one or you make a bad one. Bottom line. Holiness is always making the right decisions. While carnality, referring to the physical, referring to the flesh, is making the wrong ones. Our Christian living rises or falls in maturity <coughs> and holiness on the basis of decisions that we make. It's simple, guys. You can either say yes or no. <laughs> when Satan tempts us, we decide to either say yes or no. Right? When we have the opportunity to witness somebody, we either take advantage of that opportunity or we don't. We decide whether to go to church or not. Some didn't come this morning. It's your decision. Is it a right one? No. We decide whether we read the Bible every day or not. We decide whether we pray every day or not. We decide whether we join a ministry or even start one or not. It's not a matter of having time, but of making time. And making time requires a decision. Virtually everything we do involves a decision, including should I have a cup of coffee or not? I mean, seriously. Napoleon Bonaparte believed there was a crisis in every battle. He said there's a period of about 10 minutes, or 10 to 15 minutes, which, become, which uh, 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 the outcome depends upon. 10 minutes, you know, 10 minute window. He says taking advantage of that 10 minute window is victory. Not taking advantage of that 10 minute window is defeat. When you think about it, everything in a believer's life is an opportunity to glorify God. Since the beginning of time, God has given men choices to determine their lives. The first man to choose was Adam. Thanks. <laughs> he made the wrong choice. And guess what? Wrong choices have been plaguing mankind ever since because of sin. Speaking to Israel in the wilderness, God said this in Deuteronomy 13. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today. Therefore, I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. At Shechem, Joshua said in, in the popular Joshua 24, 15, if, is it, if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. And on Mount Carmel, Elijah asked the wavering Israelites in 1 Kings 18, How long will you go limping around between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Think about the patriarchs we just studied here in chapter 11. Abel chose God's way by offering the proper sacrifice and was blessed. Cain rejected God's way. He chose the other way, rejected by his own kind of offering. He was cursed. Enoch chose God's way and was raptured up to heaven without even passing go. <laughs> Noah and his family chose God's way, and they continually obeyed him, and they were saved from the flood. Everybody else chose another way, and they all drowned. Abraham chose God's way by believing him, regardless of how things looked, and Abraham was counted as righteous. Everybody else chose God's way and died in their sins. Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, who we talked about last week, chose God's way, and, and they exhibited faith that conquered death. Everybody else chose the wrong way, right? And they chose another way, and death conquered them. I mean, bottom line, you get the point. It's real simple. It's real simple. Life, our lives are determined by the decisions we make. Why? Because Satan tries to persuade our decisions by temptation. Satan tries to make his way seem very attractive and good, while making God's way seem hard and, un and unjoyable, right? Well, he's very good at what he does. He's very good at what he does. <clears throat> we know God's will in the matter when we choose it by faith. And we know it is right because it's God's will, even before we see the results. God's will is the only reason why we need. It's the only reason we need is God's will. 
to make the right decisions. However, and this is the key, if we don't know much about God's word, we're not going to know much about God's will. And if we don't know much about either of those, we're not going to be making a lot of right decisions. We're not. We're just not. Every decision I made prior to salvation was probably bad. Not, not everyone. I made one right one. She's sitting right here. <laughs> I even tried to throw that one away. <laughs> Moron. <laughs> but mature faith is everything when it comes to making the right decisions. Obedient, God-fearing believers make the best decisions because they are the ones that are indoctrinated in truth. They are the ones that are saturated by God's ways, which in turn is a spirit-led, filled life. When we choose God's way, we put up our shield of faith, and temptations and allurements of Satan are deflected. Ephesians 6.16. 6, In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The opposite of choosing God's way is choosing Satan's way. Not believing in God is believing in Satan. Not following God is following Satan. Not even following your own way. Following your own way is following Satan. Whenever we sin, we believe Satan. We believe that his way is better than God's. We believe the father of lies above the father of, I'm sorry, we believe the father of lies above the father of truth when we don't follow God. It comes down to a decision. And undoubtedly, the two most prominent figures of the Old Testament are Abraham and Moses. And it's no surprise that the writer spends more time on these two than any other else. Why? These two guys made right decisions. Moses, like Abraham, made right decisions. And Moses lived most of his life before the covenant of Sinai with its systems and its commandments and rituals. But, but both before and after Sinai, he lived by faith, not by works. No other person other than Jesus Christ illustrated the power of right decisions other than, than Jesus, who was Moses. I mean, he just made one good decision after another. His decisions were right. You know why? Because his faith was. And although Moses' name was attached to the law, the law of Moses, he was a man that lived by faith, not by the law. He used the law. That's the key guy. He used that law to help make the right decision. The same way we use scripture to make our decisions. Sometimes we just blurt out a decision without really looking at God's word to see, will that decision glorify him? Is it good for us? We, we instead, of, instead of quickly hearing, and we're, we're, we're was slowly hearing and quickly speaking. We need to do the opposite. He was used of God to deliver the law, yes, but he helped the law, to, he used the law to make his decisions. The law acted as a tutor. The law set a standard by which we were to follow. However, no one is saved by the law, and even Moses knew that. No one can keep the law, only Jesus. The law was put in place to show our sin, to point us to a savior. And to the Jews, Moses ranks as one of the most respected Old Testament figures who show that he lived by faith, not legalism, was a loud message to the Jews. That he didn't live, live by the law, he lived by faith, using the law as his guide. And as we will see, the life of Moses illustrates both positive and negative decisions of faith. The thing that faith accepts and the things that faith rejects. So in this text of Moses, it mentions three things that faith accepts and four things that faith rejects, and we're going to spend the next two weeks going over this text on Moses. Let's look at the first thing that faith accepts. It accepts God's plan. Look at verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that this child was beautiful, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Now, we all know the story of Moses as well known. Pharaoh of Egypt, fearing the the massive numbers of Israelites decreed that all Hebrew baby boys be drowned in the Nile. Nice guy. <laughs> nice guy. So after Moses was born, his parents, Amram and Jophed, hid him for three months. They concealed him in a basket and cast him into the drift in the Nile, trusting that baby boy to the Lord's care rather than letting him be killed by Pharaoh's soldiers. But they were smart about it because they, they picked the day where Pharaoh's daughter was bathing in a certain part of the Nile, and they put the basket drifting down to her. Still, I mean, I still think about the faith of that. You know, taking your baby boy, you know, you've had him for three months, and you hide him, and then you're going to put him in a basket in a, you know, an alligator-filled Nile River, trusting that Pharaoh's daughter would even see him and catch him, let alone whatever. I mean, that's, that's faith. 
And he was found by the princess and taken to be raised as his only child. The only reason I think they believed that she did this was she saw, she saw that the child was beautiful. There was something about Moses. He was a, he was a beautiful, I, I think all babies are ugly, but uh, he was, I mean, really? You know, my child is beautiful. Really? What are you looking for? I, 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 well, maybe at, at three months old, they get a little bit better looking, but I'm, I'm fresh out of the womb. I'm sorry. I just, you know, they're all, heads are all dented out of shape. Anyway, this child was spot on, absolutely gorgeous. So she saw something, she saw something in Moses. And Moses' and sister Mary was watching this whole thing. And she decided to go up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, I got an idea. You should have a Jewish woman nurse this child. And she agreed. And so Miriam went and got Moses' mother, Jochebed, to raise Moses as if she was his own. Well, guess what? She was his own. She just raised him in a different house. Sovereignty of God, guys, right? At its finest. But Amron and Jochebed were willing to risk their life to go against the king's edict. And this was a very, very serious matter. But they did it by faith. Saving Moses was more than their will. Of course, they didn't want the baby to die, but more importantly, they knew somehow this was God's will for this baby. We have no way of knowing how much they knew of God's plan for the destiny of their son, but they knew it was enough for them to, there was a reason to protect them from death. There has to be a reason for it, but they trusted God rather than the princess. They put their hand, their son in God's hands, not in human hands. And more proof that God is sovereign over the affairs of mankind. He worked in the heart of Pharaoh's daughter to raise this child. Jobed raised Moses, trained him, taught him Israel's promise from God. She instilled in him the things of God. She instilled in him the promise of a great deliverer, the Messiah hope, which their forefather Abraham had rejoiced. His mother helped build him up in a faith that was to become the characteristic of his life. She taught him well. A godly mother will raise godly children. By our words, yes. More importantly, by our actions. She put his life ahead of hers. She knew God had a plan for him. His plan is always more important than ours for our children. We have good, we have good plans for our children, don't we, guys? <laughs> don't we? Oh, my, you know, my child's going to be this, this, and the other thing. Well, God might have a completely different plan, and, and not for nothing, but you better get on board with that plan. Because I'm going to squash your plans for your child. And that's exactly what she meant. She knew that. So she put his life ahead of ours, ahead of hers. But that's exactly how we pass our faith down to our children, right? By our words, of course, yes, but more important, by our actions. By our actions. Children are either hardened by the hypocrisy of their parents, or like Moses, they're inspired by the consistency between words and deeds. You know, I look at some parents here, there's a lot of parents who go to church, but I don't see their kids going with them. Why? Maybe their parents are hypocrites and their kids don't believe anything they do, anything they say, because they don't see anything changing in their lives, maybe. I don't know, I'm just saying. Not for nothing, but churches ain't overly crowded with 19 and 20 year olds. They're just not. Not even bad preaching churches. Kids just don't want to go to church because they don't see no difference in their parents. I don't blame them. Hey, son, you want to go to church? I don't think so, hypocrite. Didn't do you any good? I'm serious. Really, think about that. Now, let's look at something that faith rejects. And this is where it gets tough. Faith rejects the world's prestige. Look at verse 24. It says, by faith, now we're up to Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. This is a serious decision. For 40 years, Moses was the prince of Egypt, most cultured and advanced society of their time. He was highly educated. He was skilled. He was a man of power and fame. But at the, age of, at the age of 40, he faced a crucial decision. Hmm, let's see, give up, I don't know, everything. He had become, he had to decide between become a full-fledged Egyptian, full of power, full of wealth, full of wisdom, with absolute loyalty and no reservations, or give up literally everything to join his people, Israel. Well, the deciding factor, ladies and gentlemen, was his faith in God. He had the right faith, which made the right decision. He willingly gave up wealth, power, pleasure, and honor to become a poor Jew. Many will look upon Moses' decision and cry out, Are you absolutely insane? Think about it. From a worldly standpoint, he gave up everything for nothing. 
But from a spiritual standpoint, he gave up nothing for everything. And that's the way we got to look at things. Not materialistically, but spiritually. I believe all those years he never wavered from his devotion to the Lord. His mother and father did an outstanding job raising this kid. Somehow God must have placed a desire in his heart. That's the only reasonable explanation to make that decision. He was led by God because he was a man of faith. And he made the right decision because he was led by the Spirit of God. We make the wrong decisions when we start thinking on our own, in the flesh, in the physical, looking for the material, not the spiritual. Man, we need to stop digging stuff. Because it'll consume you. It'll make it'll consume your decisions. Because you just want more stuff. The seed his parents sowed in his heart, man, when he was a child, blossomed to bear in incredible fruit. It's also just another fact that when God calls you to do something, bro, you don't go kicking and screaming. You just don't. When he calls you to do something, your heart and mind is so overwhelmed with God's will, it cannot be denied or ignored. It just can't. The things the world counts as great have nothing to do with what God considers great. God honors people on a totally different basis. You look at this church. We're not a big church by no means. I'm not a, I'm not a prominent pastor by no means, but when God looks at this church compared to Osteen's church, he looks at this church as... God doesn't, he doesn't care about numbers. He doesn't care about size of church. He doesn't care about converts. You know what he cares about? What's preached. So when I stand before God, I'm not patting myself on the back, but when I stand before God, God will honor me. Jesus told him a man greater than any king, any pharaoh, any ruler. He told him a man who's better than Abraham, Noah, Elijah. Who do you think he's talking about? Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, Truly I say to you, among those born of a woman, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. Why did Jesus consider John the Baptist the greatest? Well, he had none. <laughs> Prestige, he was despised. Honor, Arrested, then beheaded. He had a lot of materials. What did he wear? Camel skin and ate locusts. Then why did he consider him the greatest? Because John the Baptist was the most obedient to God. Here was a man who gave up everything to follow God's will, to pave a way for the Messiah. He gave up everything. So see how God honors people? He looks at people different than we do. I love that. John loved the Lord, not the world. And guess what? Moses did exactly that. Moses was a type of Christ. Think about what Jesus gave up. We brag here about John the Baptist, right? Think about what Jesus gave up. He was the Lord of glory, the creator and sustainer of all things. Gave up the worship of angels, the worship of everything in heaven to come down here and be despised, mocked, ridiculed. He paved the way for us. But John the Baptist was a, was a type of Christ. Moses was a type of Christ. Jesus, the Lord of glory, gave up everything to honor the Father. As, as long as we can break with God in order to protect our worldly interests, we're not living by faith. The strength of our faith is proved by self-denial. Self-denial. Missionaries are the perfect example of self-denial. You think about our Karen. You're right. Karen never got married. It's not that she was ugly. Karen, very beautiful lady. She, she didn't want anybody in, in, interrupting her her will for God, for, for, her, for God's life, her, her life for God. She was called to be a missionary. She gave up everything. Everything. She, her whole adult life was serving others in foreign countries. Greg Yoder, same thing. The guys in the head of CWO. 
He's the head of five churches in Haiti and Africa. Guess how much money he makes? Nothing. The guy still goes paycheck to paycheck. Do you realize what he's doing with his life? It's not about stuff. It's not about materials, ladies and gentlemen. It's about glorifying God. Man. He has a lawn cutting business on the side. And look at all the things he does in Haiti. Man. What did Solomon say about worldly goods anyway? <laughs> Moses cared about nothing about his Egyptian heritage or advantages. They were both pagan and worldly. More importantly, they're temporary. You know why? The world has little to offer compared to the riches and satisfaction of Christ. Moses gladly joined the people of God rather than prestige and privilege. I don't know about you, but that's where I want to be. I want to be God's people, man. Because we're the ones who make the right decisions. Look at all these moronic, pathetic decisions being made by our government today. Good night. Let's look at another thing faith rejects. We ain't done here. Faith rejects the world's pleasures. I love this verse, verse 25. <clears throat> Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God. Do you believe that? Choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. <laughs> Young people, you better listen hard. No one needs to be convinced that sin is often fun. It's awesome. <laughs> it is. Been there, done that. But there's two characteristics the world that has no idea what sin is. It's always evil, and it's always passing by. And no matter how temporarily satisfying it may be, its satisfaction is destined to fade, and you're destined for ruin. I've been there, done that. And it has no good in it. It can bring no good to us, to anyone else, or especially to God. Any seeming good is both deceptive and fleeting. You ever wonder why? Unbelievers, God-haters, all these people of evil are prominent and high, high exalted. Does that ever tick you off? I'm not preaching to the choir. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How, how does their life just seem to go so well? They're successful, they're famous, they're wealthy, they're healthy. It seems like they're all practically in every way. You look at Hollywood, right? You look at the wicked politicians, you look at all the dictators all over these third world countries. Everything just seems to line up for them. And we want to plead with Jeremiah, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the treacherous thrive? You have a good question. Job, I love, we can ask about Job. Job says, why do the wicked live? Why do they reach old age? Why do they grow mighty in power? He even talks about their kids. Their offspring are established in their presence. Their descendants before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. No rod of God is upon them. I love this text. He goes on to talk about their animals. He goes, even their bulls, their bulls breed without fail. He goes, even their animals are good. Their cow calves does not miscarry. They send out their little boys like a flock and their children dance and sing with the tambourines. They spend their days in prospering and prosperity. They say to God, depart from us. We do not desire the knowledge of your ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? Job had all these questions, and then here's what he answers his rhetorical questions with. Listen. And suddenly they go down to hell. Well, there's your answer, ladies and gentlemen. There's your answer. They die, judgment comes, and they got misery for the rest of eternity. Now, should we wish that on them? Yeah, no. <laughs> no. But even Job's friend so far, who was a who was a mook, didn't help his friend at all. He had it right when he said. The triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the godless is only for a moment. That's so true. That is so true. So I, I get a whole different perspective of men in power that are just evil. We know their destiny. We know their destiny. 
Paul gave us two cents in the New Testament about prospering and believers. He said this in Romans 2. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself. On the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgments will be revealed. James chapter 5, verse 1. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. Their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, who, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. Oh, man. Ouch. I tell that to all my rich friends. <laughs> No, even David learned the hard way. Sinful pleasures. One, he had one bad night. One bad night. His flesh got the best of him. Ruined his whole life. Was he a man after God's heart? Yeah, but God punished him the rest of his days for that one bad decision. That's what we're talking about, right? Moses knew that God was calling him to leave the pleasures of this world and to give his life for his people. He had a choice, and he obeyed, and he made the right choice. But disobeying has many attractions, doesn't it, guys? Doesn't disobeying God have many attractions? It does. It does. Even for us. But among other things, it would have been a lot easier and more enjoyable in the short run. And it's hard enough to stop seeking worldly things. It's even harder to give them up when you had them. Think about a blind person. When a blind person is born blind, he's not missing anything. Right? Think about it. But when you're 30 years old and you go blind, wow, your whole life is changed. Same with Pharaoh. He, or same with Moses. He wasn't born poor. He had everything he could possibly have, have in 40 years of his life, and he had to give all that up. Would you do that? Would you be willing to do that? Now, none of, nobody in here is wealthy as far as I know. If you are, I can't be your friend. <laughs> but think about it. I don't care how rich. Would you give up everything? Your car, your bank account, your job to follow Christ. Some of you are going, oh, well, yeah, that's, that's a right response. Because if you look at the wording here, Moses considered. Look at the wording here. In verse 26, actually, I'm not there yet. He considered. It wasn't an easy decision. He didn't just say, he didn't just say, oh, I'm a righteous man. I'm going to leave everything. For, no, he he had to ponder on that. That's a tough decision. He was 40 years old and he gave up everything. You know, I was 40 years old when I gave up everything for next year. I was the exact same age most of you. And I had a hard time. And I didn't have a lot. But I enjoyed the <laughs> snot out of my sin. I did. I loved it. But I know to follow God's will for my life, I had to give it all up. And I couldn't do it on my own. And I didn't think I could even get it done. But when you have faith, you're going to make the right decisions. I needed that right faith. I needed to be as close to God as possible so I can make the right decisions. Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? I still make some wrong ones. But not as many as I used to. I'm telling you, the closer you walk with Christ, the better your decisions will be. But you have to know him first. You have to dive in his word. You have to strive. Your desire should be to know Jesus Christ as best as you possibly can. And that will be a life that glorifies God. Especially for your young people. The, and the decision he made knew, knew he would be ridiculed by it. He knew he was no longer going to be safe, no longer going to be wealthy. He's going to have to run probably for the rest of his life. Theologian J.C. Ryle put it this way. He says, faith told Moses that affliction and suffering were not real evils. I like that. He says, they were the school of God. In which he trains the godly, the, which he trains the children of grace for glory, the medicines which are needful to purify our corrupt wills. Wow. 
Even the Apostle Paul could testify to that, right? When he wrote, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed with us. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. You know, this text may be a hard pill for some of you to swallow. A hard pill. Would you be willing? I was blown away when, when, uh, when I got saved was one thing. When I got saved, I, I didn't know what God's will was for my life. I, I, wanted, I, I didn't want to do much. I just, um, I just kind of wanted to go to church, just sit in the back pew and just kind of be like everybody else. <laughs> it's easy. Then, uh, I don't know, something just got over me, man. I just, God started, in my heart was just filled with this, this desire to, to, join, to join the ministry. Like, what, what am I, what am I, just insane? <laughs> then the more I just prayed and understood him and studied more, and, and this is, this is exhortation for you guys. Um, but the more I dove into his word and, and hung around other believers, and the, the more my path was clear. You know, some of you may not know what God has in store for you. I mean, I've been here well, I'm seven years old. So what? So what? God has a plan for all of us. And the only way we know his plan and will for our lives is to study his word. Amen. Is to pray, is to seek his will, to seek his favor. I'm telling you, and, and I, I know I wore this story out with you guys, but I don't want to do any of this. Who wants, who wants to do this? Seriously, think about it. Who wants to be a pastor? Especially today. Think about all these pastors in Africa that are getting killed, and yet there's still people raising up and taking his place. Who would want to do that? Who would want to be a mission? Who would want to give up everything, including air conditioning, to be a missionary in Haiti? I want to think about this, just this little mission trip we did last summer. Yeah, we only gave up a week of our life. It's a start. We could have spent a week on a cruise ship. Right? Those are my missionaries. We testified. We could have spent a week on our cruise ship. Would have been a lot more enjoyable, right? A lot more enjoyable. Could have, could have went to Hawaii. Could have went to Myrtle Beach. Played golf every day, sat on the beach, but we decided to go to Haiti and serve God. Best week of my life. But I didn't want to go. I wanted nothing to do with this. I wanted nothing to do with missionaries. It's not for me. It's God just... When he called, I'm telling you, it just, I had no intention to go on this mission trip. None. No. I didn't need no way. No air conditioning? You're out of your mind. Best week of my life. If God puts it on your heart, you go. You just go. Now I know why I went. Oh my God. The stuff that we've seen over there, that we dealt with, we'll probably never, we'll never do that again. I'm not saying we won't try. That's a once in a lifetime thing. Greg, the owner, said he's never seen anything like it. He's been a missionary for 40 years. When God calls you and you don't go, you're missing out. Whether it's anything, I'm not talking about men, but I'm talking about the ultimate sacrifice, I believe, as a missionary. And the last thing that faith rejects in today's text, that faith rejects the world's plenty. Look at verse 26. He says, He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Wow. You got the big picture. Living as a prince in Egypt, he had everything he could imagine at his beck and call. He had everything the world holds dear. He must have been strongly tempted to hold on to them. 
That's why, again, back to that, the text said he considered. I'm sure he did a pros and cons. You guys do a pros and cons list? Right, pros and cons? Yeah, he had all pros, man. He had all pros. He didn't have one con, but he considered it. He wasn't hasty with his decision. He weighed what Egypt had to offer against what God had to offer. And he found it overwhelmingly favored in God's word. Of course. Of course. Being filled with faith, Moses believed that the worst he could endure for Christ would be more valuable than anything Egypt could offer in flesh. Wow. But it's interesting how the writer speaks of Moses considering the reproach of Christ nearly five or fifteen hundred years before Christ. However, in this text, Christ is the Greek form of Messiah, the Holy One, anointed. The Messiah which his mom told about all those years would come. Moses rejected the treasures of Egypt and all that he would possess and took stand for God. Took stand for God. That's what we, we must do today. And God's reward is always greater than anything this world has to offer. God's reward is eternal. Eternal. The world's reward is just temporary. He chose to identify himself with Christ rather than the world. Jesus testified to that. He says in John's Gospel, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. He knew about Christ. And on the Mount of Transfiguration, who was standing with Jesus? <clears throat> Moses. Talking about what? The cross. The cross. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus were talking about the upcoming crucifixion. By faith, Moses knew that before the crown, they lay a cross. Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. This is the same exact reward he was looking for, right at the end of verse 26. Look what he said. For he was looking to the reward. This is the choice Moses made and the reward that he sought. This is the choice each of us must make today. And faith will always choose right. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the richness of this text, Lord. How Moses, a man of faith, voluntarily and willingly gave up everything he held dear to follow Christ. Oh, Father, thank you, Lord, for this text. Thank you for this wonderful example of a selfless person. Of a person, Lord, who got the big picture. The eternal reward, Lord. Father, thank you for this wonderful example. Father, I just pray, Lord, for each heart in this congregation, Father. That if there's something holding them back from serving you, Father, I pray that you would remove it from them. I pray, Lord God, that you would put in everyone's heart in this congregation a desire and a fervency to serve you, Lord, whether it be in ministry or just in our daily lives, Lord. Just to be a blessing to others, our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, our colleagues. That is serving as well. Thank you for this rich text, Lord. Thank you again for the faith of Moses. Thank you for this chapter, which we're, we're learning so much from these wonderful patriarchs, Lord. And the decisions that they made, Lord, were right decisions because they made them by faith. Lord, help our faith. Help us to make the right decisions, Lord. Because wrong decisions, Lord, will lead us down a dark path, but the right decisions will lead us towards the cross. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you. And I pray that as we pick up our offering, that you bless it, multiply it, Use it for the spreading of your kingdom right here in Palm Coast. In Jesus' most beautiful name we pray.